Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. And uh, pleased to be here with you for the virtual reading group. We're starting a new book, or actually, it's the first time, not a new book per se, but a new series of thematically uh, chosen readings. So we had been reading the Jewish question, or, or actually Hannah Arendt's Jewish writings. Um, and those, uh, you know, I think a lot of us found them incredibly rich and, and helpful in, in thinking about the, the particular place that Hannah Arendt comes from. What, what I mean by that is, um, you know, if we think back to her essays on Kant's judgment, uh, Kant's political thinking and political philosophy, um, you know, she says that there's a conflict between the spectator point of view, the, the view of the impartial spectator and the actor. And for Kant, um, uh, judgment is the, is the point of view of the spectator and thus not an actor, someone who looks at the world from afar. She says that the actor is always partial. The actor is always, if you want to use a word, prejudiced. Um, the actor always comes from a particular home or perspective. And, and so much of Arendt's writing can seem at times like um, the writing of an impartial spectator, um, someone who um, seemingly has an incredible ability to look at the world from afar, um, uh, to be a, a conscious pariah, as she sometimes calls it, to be an outsider. And, and that ability to, to look from afar is, is one of the things that I think makes her thoughts so powerful, um, that she's such a, a thinker of, of judgment who can constantly look at her own perspective from, from other perspectives and, and, and be willing to put it up to criticism and to, to question. Um, but that means that uh, it's hard to act from that, from that perspective because you're constantly questioning your actions, your, your, your perspectives. The Jewish writings were, were fascinating because you see, at least in part of them, Hannah Arendt as an actor, as someone who's involved in a, a, a political struggle. Um, you know, she's, she's been arrested, exiled, stateless, and, and she sees herself as a partisan, as an actor in the, in the Jewish struggle. And yet over time, as we read her, we also see that she comes to also become a spectator and look at it from a different perspective. And, and especially after her essays on Zionism to sort of step back and, and, and take on that more critical spectatorial role. Um, and so uh, it's a fascinating uh, book to read of Hannah Arendt's because uh, it, 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 it somewhat frustrates or complicates our understanding of Arendt as as a thinker, um, and also we see her as an actor. Um, and, and I think that's an important uh, corrective and, and an important part of who she was. She knew when to act and she knew when to think. I think that's actually very much uh, part of what she's doing. Well, we're, we're going to um, uh, come to uh, today starting a series of readings on Hannah Arendt and race and prejudice. Um, and these are going to be complicated for a number of reasons. One, because simply in 2023, talking about race is, is a difficult thing. Um, uh, two, because um, Arendt, in much of her writing on race, uh, and by race, I just want to be clear that she means both racism and anti-Semitism and other isms, also Marxism and Darwinism, as we'll get to today. Um, she, she writes at it, she writes about race quite often, at least most of the time, but not all the time from the spectatorial point of view, from this distance, from this, um, perspective of the thoughtful judge who tries to share all opinions and try to come to an impartial judgment. And, um, that amongst other things has, frustrated some of her readers, many of her readers, 
Uh, it's one of the reasons that people like Gershom Sholem, who we read at, near the end of the book on the Jewish writings, was so angry at Arendt for treating the Jews not as her people, right? And she responds, you know, the only people, you know, I have ever had are my friends, not any collective. Um, and that is frustrating to someone who wants her to be a partisan, uh, to have prejudice uh, for her people or for a people. And um, and that, that ability of hers to, to step away, you know, really does, I mean, it's one of the reasons so many people didn't like her book. So many Jews, especially, didn't like her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, because they, she thought it was too, they thought it was too ironic, not angry enough, not committed enough as a Jew. And that same attitude is going to now come up in her writings on race, and it's going to challenge us, right? It's going to challenge us as readers um, of her on race to, on the one hand, take her seriously on her own terms, which is as someone writing uh, from afar, as a judge, as, a, as someone who tries to let her mind go wandering and understand all perspectives and not as a partisan most of the time. And there will be some things we read in which she takes on the partisan, the actor's perspective, not the spectatorial or judge's perspective. And, 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 and the question is, A, um, can we understand her in that perspective? And B, do we think it's justified, right? Do we think it's okay in talking about something like race to take this spectatorial um, perspective? And, uh, and that will be one of the questions um, that we have. Uh, you know, I mean, we always say here, um, we're going to try and treat each other's with respect and, 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 and arguments. Uh, we talk about the arguments, not the people, you know, I think I'll just reemphasize that as we, as we're about to get into this. Um, so anyway, as I said, we're going to talk about a number of her arguments on race. I mean, Arendt's, uh, written a fair bit on race, a lot on race, actually, um, for better or worse, most of what people know about what she wrote on race is the, um, short essay she wrote, Reflections on Little Rock, and the then new introduction she wrote to it later. Um, and I think it's really uh, important um, that that be seen as simply one of many um, uh, articles uh, that Arendt wrote on race throughout her life. And, and, and it's a topic that really did uh, consume her from the earliest writings to her latest writings. And um, so part of what we're going to try and do is in a sense, increase the archive, expand the archive of, of, of RN's thinking on race um, to include a lot of uh, texts that are not usually um, thought of as, as her texts on race. And, uh, and I'm, in doing so, I hope it will begin to allow us to take, to look at what she's saying as something I think quite meaningful, um, that she actually do, does have something profound to say about race that I think... Um, whether you agree with it or not, in the end, the effort to understand it is important in understanding our current um, attempts to think about and talk about race today. So that's the that's the idea. Um, I will just say that you know this is uh, uh, part of a, a a larger interest uh, of mine, but also of the Hunter and Centers. Um, Jana Schmidt uh, also writes on Arendt and race, has written some really wonderful stuff, and that she and I will be this um, this summer in June running a, a workshop, uh, a three or four day workshop on Arendt and race that um, especially people in Osen, but other people can apply to uh, on our website. And, and Jana, if you're in, if, and if you're interested, that you can write to Jana or I uh, about that. Um, all right. The first text that we're going to talk about on, on race in this is from The Origins of Totalitarianism, a book that you know many of us have read. We've read it in this group a few times. Um, and uh, to the extent uh, people read The Origins of Totalitarianism, they don't usually focus on the question of race, uh, except for the sense that they focus on the question of anti-Semitism. Um, I guess the one exception is the the few sentences that Arendt writes about, um, uh, uh, or well, the chapter she writes on race in Africa, which we'll read for next week, um, but that has a few sentences that have become part of the, I think, out of context 
um, sentences that people pull out where Arendt talks about um, primitives and savages. Um, but we, we're going to try and, again, expand it. And we'll start then with this uh, chapter uh, called um, Race Thinking Before Racism, which is chapter six and the second chapter of the section on totalitarianism. Now, I, I mentioned last week uh, that I was going to start a few pages earlier than that. So um, it's the second chapter of imperialism. And the first chapter on imperialism is called The Political Emancipation of the Bourgeoisie. And um, that chapter argues that the, the attitudes and the politics of the bourgeoisie, the emancipation of the bourgeoisie, was essential to imperialism. And imperialism is going to be this idea of political expansion that's going to challenge the nation state and be the precursor towards totalitarianism in, in the argument of the book. One of the core ideas of the chapter on um, uh, the, the political emancipation of the bourgeoisie is Arendt's argument that Thomas Hobbes is the great thinker of bourgeois values. Um, in a sense that Hobbes is the person who articulates what it means to be a bourgeois. And for Arendt, um, the principles that our Hobbes associates with he, what he calls man, but which he says are not man, but bourgeois man, are a few. One is that reasoning is reckoning and power is the only content of politics. So if traditionally man had been thought to be a rational animal from Aristotle up to Kant, Hobbes says, no, man is a reckoning animal. By reckoning, he means that they calculate, and they calculate in the name of acquiring power. So that man for Hobbes is a power-seeking animal. Um, and that power, because it is something that must constantly grow or it will disappear, has to increase or it will die, means that bourgeois man, man has to constantly increase his power or expand. Um, and so power becomes a kind of self-fulfilling goal. Um, man doesn't exist for some other end, for goodness or, or religion or, or for meaning, but exists simply to not be dead and thus to be ever more powerful, the will to power as Nietzsche pred it, um, called it. And this kind of power-seeking proton nature of man um, uh, is Arendt says sort of the is is the is the idea of the bourgeoisie cleansed of hypocrisy. When the bourgeoisie is not hypocritical and saying, "Oh, we really value you know rules and law and things," what the bourgeois want is to acquire more and more money, more and more power, more and more authority, and they'll do it through colonialism. They'll do it through. Um, imperialism they'll do it by putting uh, opponents in jail or even killing their opponents the mob and so the mob becomes um in a sense the essence of the bourgeoisie cleansed of hypocrisy and so uh just a few pages before the chapter race thinking before racism on page 156 arendt is talking about the mob um and the rise of the mob and she calls the mob the refuse of all classes um, it's, it's, it's sort of the, it's, it's the cleansed, it's the people who claim we are the people. Um, and in claiming we are the people, uh, they claim that, that, they, that they can destroy anyone who stands against them because they represent the people. Um, this idea of the mob um, and of political thought in the Habesian sense, Arendt calls uh, the prerequisite for all race doctrines. Um, that is the exclusion in principle of the idea of humanity, right? That's on, on, on page 157. But the basic idea here is that Hobbes himself was not a racial thinker, at least not explicitly. I mean, we can, I'm sure we can find uh, race, racial thoughts in Hobbes. But what Arendt is saying is, his idea of man as a power-seeking proton, his idea that there, man is, 
exists to gain more power means that men must constantly overcome other men. It means that um, even though there's no explicit um, race doctrine, uh, he leads his thought underlies the idea that man is broken up into races and each race is arguing for itself and, and and venturing for itself so that we end up with a war of all against all. Uh, and she writes on 157, if it should prove to be true that we are imprisoned in Hobbes's endless process of power accumulation, then the organization of the mob will inevitably take the form of transformation of nations into races. For there is, under con the conditions of an accumulating society, no other unifying bond available between individuals who in the very process of power accumulation and expansion are losing all natural connections with their fellow men. Basically, in an accumulating society, we want to accumulate more and more. And we lose the idea of an idea of humanity that shares us. And what we have is each race for itself. And so the mob will take the form of the transformation of nations into races. Um, once this idea of humanity, uh, she says, is lost, we can no longer restrain the drive for power. There are no limits to the theories of power accumulation. And then she says, quote, on 157, brown, yellow, or black races are descended from others, some other species of apes than the white race. This is what racism will entail and that all together are predestined to war against each other until they have disappeared from the face of the earth and thus she warns that the descent from humanity into races is quote politically speaking not the beginning of humanity but its end so that's the that that reading of hobbes and bourgeois the bourgeois attitude towards life the idea that um race begins with the loss of the principle of humanity and the embrace of man as simply a power-hungry person uh, who seeks to constantly increase power is the beginning of, Arendt thinks, um, the principle of racism. She then follows this with two chapters, um, which we're going to read, one this week and one next week. The first is called Race Thinking Before Racism. Um, the second uh, is called Race and Bureaucracy. Um, race and Bureaucracy is the chapter that's going to focus really on the birth of racism, although she's going to define it here as well. And in this chapter on race thinking before racism, she begins by telling us, in a sense, four different things about racism, right? So these are, you know, she never will put it this way, but you can think of these as four theses about racism. The first on 158 um, is that racism has been the powerful ideology of imperialistic policies since the turn of our century. Right? Um, racism is an ideology and it's connected with imperialism. Connected with imperialism, which we'll talk about more next week when we talk about race and bureaucracy, but basically because imperialism is the anti-national idea of expansion if the nation state holds us together as as a as a as a single people whoever lives in a nation racism expands beyond the nation to anyone who's part of our race and is an imperialist growing idea expansionary idea it's an ideology um insofar as it offers a key to history or the solution to the riddles of the universe um the two great ideologies of um, modern times, Arendt thinks, are Marxism, which sees the um, key to history in the idea of the struggle of the classes, and racism, which sees the key to history as the struggle amongst the races. What both these things are as ideologies, Marxism and racism, are, 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 are pseudoscientific ideas that explain why one group, the proletariat or a particular race, the Aryans or the white race, will and should and must and is justified in um, justifying itself over another race. That's sort of the first idea that racism and a powerful ideology of imperialistic policies. Um, I'm going to look at it. I'm just going to mute us.
Um, Yana, can you just mute everyone so we, we're okay? Um, racism, the second uh, thesis is that racism and all ideologies are not scientific, but political. That is that they're political weapons. Um, uh, and their scientific aspect is secondary. So even though we think of it as scientific or pseudoscientific, Marxism, Darwinism, racism, what really matters is not the scientific aspect, but their political uh, usefulness. The third is that racism is an explanation for deeds of imperialism, um, and that it begins, therefore, with imperialism and the scramble for Africa. Uh, and the fourth is that racism is not nationalism. On contrary, racism, she says, tends to destroy the body politic of the nation. Uh, racism, she'll say on 161, racists have a worse, worse record of patriotism than the representatives of all other international ideologies together. And they were the only ones who consistently denied the great principle upon which national organizations of people are built, the principle of equality and solidarity of all peoples guaranteed by the idea of mankind. Um, and so against the nation creating 19th century, she sees racism as a nation destroying and humanity annihilating power. That's on page 162. All right. We see in her account of racism, and I just want to be clear about this, a very extreme definition of racism, right? Racism is an ideology associated with justifying and carrying out brutal deeds. Um, that's not how we see racism today, and, and I, and I want to be clear about that. And, and so part of, part of what we're going to have to talk about in the next seven to 10 weeks as we talk about Harent and race is to what extent it's worthwhile limiting her definition of racism as she does to this kind of an ideological, non-anti-national um, explanation for deeds. Now, in doing so, she opposes or differentiates racism from what she calls race thinking. And this chapter is called Race Thinking Before Racism. And race thinking, which is not a term we usually use, we could use it, another, another term for that might be um, prejudice. And we're not going to talk so much about prejudice today, but later in other texts we will read, she's going to use not the word race thinking, but the word prejudice for, I think, a very similar idea. Um, race thinking, she says, is simply an opinion, one of the many free opinions on 159. And at the end of the chapter on 183, she says, in this chapter, I've sought to tell the story of an opinion. Um, to call race thinking an opinion, therefore, simply one of the many opinions that people have, a free opinion, um, you know, again, is in our age a challenge. And it was, I think, even in Arendt's age. It's to say that to talk about race and to talk about racial differences is not the same as racism. It's to say that we can have meaningful um, differences of opinion about race. Race can be part of the conversation in not a negative way, or it can be in a negative way, but it's still not racism. And that's, again, something that I think... Uh, many people today would disagree with. In any case, she says, um, all precursors to race thinking or all race thinking is our theories of distinction. Distinction, discrimination, prejudice. They're all um, think theories and thinkings that says there are differences among races that matter. But she doesn't think they're racist, why? because they're not ideological and they're not mobilized politically um, in order to justify uh, uh, horrible deeds, killing, oppression, slavery, et cetera. And insofar as that, she wants to say, look, we have to distinguish these things called race thinking from racism. And she does that and she goes through a five stage account of the distinction between race thinking and racism. 
the first, uh, which uh, she calls a race of aristocrats um, against a nation of citizens, beginning on 161, uh, talks about two French thinkers, Boulian Vieille, uh, who she also associates with Montesquieu, and someone named Montlosier, who I don't know. Um, the basic idea here is that for these thinkers, um, race is thought on the idea, on the ideal of a nobility of conquest. There's the idea that might makes right, um, in the sense that if you if you're the Gauls or the Franks and you conquer the Gauls, you're in the right. Conquest leads to an evidence of superiority. Um, and there's a few things that she says to remember here is that we're not talking really about races, we're talking about peoples, the Franks versus the Gauls. Um, and and so and, and, and so and it's not a justification for barbarism. It's simply saying that um, the Franks are a, a, an aristocratic race, a good race, because they won. Um, and, and so that's the first stage. And she says, you can think about race like this, and you can talk about you know, the Francs in this way, uh, but, but not be a racist. The second, which she calls race unity uh, as a substitute for national emancipation, uh, begins on, on 165. And here um, she's talking about um, this idea, the, the idea that uh, we, we begin to think about who we are as a people uh, through as an idea of race. And she says, as long as the claim of a common origin in nationalism was linguistic, as it was at the beginning, it is not racism in the modern sense. So if we all speak the same language as Francs or Germans or Russians, um, we're not race. It's not a race. It's just a linguistic community. But after 1814, she says the German discourse, the specifically German discourse, shifts from thinking about language to blood and blood relationships, family ties and tribal unity come to the fore. And she says that this shift comes is born of a failure of the German nationalist hopes that they they didn't succeed in creating a German nation. And so they began to invent this idea of a blood unity to aid in their nationalist struggle. Um, and they start to see that every race is a separate race based on blood, you know, organically. And you think, oh, that sounds pretty racist. Um, but even then, RN says, there's no actual racism because they still sought to create a German nation of equals. Everyone in, born on the ground of Germany would be an equal German. And she says that you know, racism is incompatible with nationalism. Um, and this was still a nationalist idea of race thinking. The third and, and by far the most um, controversial of her claims here, or of her claims of, of race thinking, um, considers what she calls the new key to history um, that was articulated by Count Arthur de Gobineau in his essay on the inequality of the human races. Um, Gobineau is today one of those people who's usually thought of as the first great racist or one of the first great racists. And his worry, um, RN says, was that the decline, the civilization was declining, and he seeks a cause for that decline. And his answer was that it that the French civilization was was endangered by the mixing of the races, right? That different races were mixing, and you're losing a kind of purebred race. He prophesied the doom of civilization from a mixture of blood. And what he wanted was to create a new elite to replace the defeated aristocracy. And the new elite that he would create would be based on a romantic ideal of an innate personality, those who felt them to be superior or noblemen. And the proof for Gobineau of one's nobility or elect status was that they accepted a race ideology, a race. Um, uh, and so he thought that you could elevate a mixed race of half-breeds to a master race if they came to think of themselves as an elite on this feelings of nobility, nobility or feelings of superiority. And so, um, uh, you know, as I said, Gobineau is, is, is usually considered a racist. Arendt says that he offered a pseudoscientific theory of decline based on race. And she says, quote, on page, um, uh, on, on page uh, 172, he invented racism almost by accident. But even then, she then says, we have to be a little more nuanced. 
and distinguish his race thinking from racism. In her telling, Gobineau is more of a romantic who, idealize, who idolizes notions of nobility than a racist who will support violence and oppression. His race thinking, she says, betrayed the inherent responsibility of romantic opinions more than the brutality of racist ideologies. Nowhere does Gobineau propose racial murder, racial slavery, or racial criteria for citizenship and rights. So for Arendt, unlike the race laws in South Africa, the bureaucratic rule of Africans and Indians and Egypt and India, the chattel slavery of Africans in the Americas and the racial genocide of Jews by the Nazis, Gobineau and other race thinkers never moved beyond opinions about race to outright racism. And here you get, I think, one of the most important lines of her thinking on race. There is an abyss between the man of brilliant and facile conceptions and man of brutal deeds. And this is, in a sense, you know, I think the center of her idea that about between race thinking and racism, you can talk about race, you can have prejudices, you can not like races, you can be an anti-Semite and you can be someone who doesn't like Muslims or blacks or Jews or, or whites. That doesn't make you racist. It makes you prejudiced. It makes you a race thinker. But a racist for her, right, is someone who actually um, engages in brutal deeds and justifies them on the uh, on the on, on race. Um, the fourth uh, section is on the entailed inheritance and the rights of Englishmen and deals with Burke amongst others. Um, it also uh, deals with Darwin. And again, um, she gives three different um, articulations of the way race can be mobilized, um, you know, in a political way. One is polygenic, polygenetics, uh, where you deny the relation of the races at all. Two is Darwinism and progress, namely that um, Darwinism uh, has this idea that we are come from animals or apes. And uh, Darwinism can be used to say that some races are lower and other races are higher. Uh, and third, that uh, racism in the end is becomes a race thinking becomes a middle class idea um, of national feeling, so that race noblizes the common people. All of this is simply part of her general idea that race thinking is not racism; it's the history of an idea. Uh, and she says that these these thinkers, these race thinkers, were not racists. They were eugenicists, they were imperialists, but they were not racists. They still hoped, she thought, to contribute to a new unity of humanity and mankind. Which means that she thinks that racism will only emerge when these race doctrines are then combined with the need to politically be weaponized. And that happens with imperialism and the scramble for Africa, which will be the next chapter. So on 184, she'll say imperialism would have necessitated the invention of racism as the only possible explanation and excuse for its deeds. And that's the transition to racism. All right. Um, again, I understand these are uh, difficult and complicated ideas, uh, controversial. Um, let's try and um, approach them in a, in a spirit of understanding, and but we can be critical. Uh, there's no reason not to be critical, but of the ideas. Um, you can talk in the chat, and again, please be respectful. And you can also raise your hand and we can have a conversation here. Um, so uh, I look forward to this conversation, the beginning of a couple of weeks of, a, I think, a really important conversation. And Jerry, it's good to see you. You're muted, Jerry, so you're gonna have to unmute yourself. Is that better? Yes. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Roger, just a quick point. I may have missed, I think I did miss what you were saying. Were you, were you trying, or did you make a connection between Thomas Hobbes and racist thinking or racism? Because it's uh, by way of power. Yes. I, I see. I don't, could you just say a word or two about that again? Because I missed it. I, 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 I'm interested because I have never quite seen the connection between 
Hobbes and racism. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I started, you know, so what I said is that this chapter, chapter six, begins um, race thinking before racism. Um, but the three pages before that, at the end of the chapter on the political emancipation of the bourgeoisie, um, uh, talk about um, the rise of the mob and uh, the rise of the mob as she says, bourgeois thinking cleansed of hypocrisy. And she says that um, uh, even though Hobbes himself was not someone who thought racially, she says on 157, the philosophy of Hobbes, it is true, contains nothing of modern race doctrines, which not only stir up the mob, but in their totalitarian form, outline very clearly the forms of organization through which humanity could carry the endless process of capital and power accumulation through to its logical end in self-destruction. But Hobbes at least provided political thought with the prerequisite for all race doctrines. That is the exclusion and principle of the idea of humanity, which constitutes the sole regulating idea of international law. And she says later below, if the idea of humanity, which the most, which of which the most conclusive symbol is the common origin of the human species is no longer valid, then nothing is more plausible than a theory according to which brown, yellow, or black races are descended from some other species of apes than the white race and that all together are predestined by nature to war against each other until they have disappeared from the face of the earth. And so um, you have to go back then to the second part of this chapter, the political emancipation of the bourgeoisie, where she talks about Hobbes. And the, the argument in that section is that the great insight of Hobbes was to be the only, the first philosopher who understood man as bourgeois man. As, and in doing so, she says, the fundamental principle of bourgeois man and the fundamental um, axiom of Habesian thinking is that man is a reckoning animal, not a rational animal. And insofar as he's a reckoning animal, um, he's an animal that seeks power um, and not some higher end like reason. And so he exists only to increase his power because if he loses his power, he will be killed. And, and so um, this idea of man as a power seeking animal, as a, uh, which Arendt thinks is the Habesian idea of man, which she thinks is the bourgeois idea of man, um, means that men are in a constant state of conflict and war and, and, and they need to constantly um, uh, kill others in order to protect their power and have to increase their power. And the and it's and if you understand that, she says, there's nothing more natural that you break into the races, and you understand that it's a race war and or a class war, right? Um, which is why she thinks that uh, um, Marxism is also a, a Bezian idea. Um, the point is that both of the great ideologies of the 19th and 20th century, racism and Marxism, um, are for Arendt deeply Habesian in their, in their origin, uh, insofar as they begin um, with this unrestrained, unlimited, expansive need to constantly accumulate more power. Um, does that make sense, Jerry? Is that helpful? Um, you're, you're muted again. Uh, Jerry, you're muted again. So, sorry. Uh, is that all right? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Roger. I, I have a lot of uh, trouble with that explanation of Hobbes, but I don't want to take any more time. Thank you. Okay. You have trouble with it as Hobbes or it as Arendt on Hobbes? I mean, I don't know, no, no, it's, it's a way of reading Arendt on Hobbes that, that, I, that I find problematic, but. Okay, I mean, I'd love to hear, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean. We'll talk about it one day, Roger, okay? Okay. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, you know, just, you know, there's a reason that Hobbes has a whole section of this chapter on political emancipation of the bourgeoisie. And there's, a, and there's a reason she says that he's the, that his doctrines are the, or that his thinking. <laughs> but but well, 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 let me just say this, Roger. Yeah. That, um, when uh, you, you say we're, we're in a state of war, of one against all. That's actually Hobbes' description of, <clears throat> of the state of nature. Hobbes' state, the bourgeois state, absolutely uh, prevents that. It is meant to prevent that for not permanently, not in a, not permanently in the world government, but for entities, for nation states. Absolutely, absolutely, Jerry. Yeah. And I mean, as, as I understand RN's reading of Hobbes, right? The Bush, since Hobbes has an idea of man as a power seeking proton, as she calls it, who constantly wants to seek power, but man, which she calls bourgeois man, needs uh, a sovereign government uh, to stand over them and provide uh, security. And security thus becomes the dominant concern of um, bourgeois man. Insofar as what that does, is it allows for the unfettered uh, pursuit of power in our private life, so long as we don't interfere with others. And that's, that's her understanding of bourgeois government um, on a domestic level. On an, on, an, on an imperialistic or external level, uh, we uh, put the army of the armies of our states behind the bourgeoisie in their effort to create power accumulation outside the state uh, in colonialism. Um, and so that's that's how she that's how I understand her reading um, Hobbes in this. Yeah, but, but there's just a, a a question of how much you can contribute what you have said now to Hobbes. That's all. But, Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean that's a good point, and I and I think there are people who don't think Arendt reads Hobbes correctly. I mean, I I sort of do, but I do too, people. actually. But I I think you know, but some people don't. But I mean, I think that is her reading of Hobbes. Um, and but we can talk yeah. about it another time. But that's that's at least uh, she had great respect for him, for Hobbes, for his mind, for his logic. Absolutely. And she thinks he's the greatest thinker of the modern man, um, of modern man. But she also thinks that there are dangers in that thought. It's not Thomas. Thank you, book. Roger. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Ray, uh, is that Rachel or Raquel? Ra Raquel? Hi, can you hear me? Um, yes. Sorry. Great. Um, oh, I'm so delighted that uh, you guys that were reading these uh, sections, and um, I really appreciated your uh, review. And I just I've been thinking, you know, about origins since the beginning of the pandemic, and um, this chapter seems to stand out a, lo a lot to me. And to the nuances of her discussion seems to invite us to think critically about our own time, not just to sort of measure the degree to which she stands up to our, you know, a, a allegedly correct view or politically correct view, but helps us understand the degree to which perhaps our own thought is weaponized. And just as an aside, I think um, it's, or as a context, I think it's important to understand that she's writing this right after World War II when the UN is being formed and Julian Huxley is the head of UNESCO. And so there are specific reference points as, you know, people are trying to um, figure out how to you know, defend human rights and not be racist. And the, um, the, the pitfalls that they fall into, which I think are evident, uh, she's commenting in, in some of the notes in the text, are things we are still, pitfalls we're falling into, as if any time we make a distinction about something racial or cultural, it's prejudiced or something. Like you can't, comedians can't tell jokes 
we and and we we are where people are uh, editing children's books so that you know they we, we no longer make distinctions and those I think Arendt would be very horrified at, that our um, our confusion about thought and uh, descriptions of reality are are working against our capacity to perceive things. But more more importantly, I think it's it's important to keep in mind that. She, she points out that race thinking, like class thinking, is something that had some connection to reality, and so it was able to be weaponized and is still very much weaponized. But she makes um, an important uh, nuance, which I think you covered, Roger, is that this is always something where the, the political agenda, the deed, comes first, and then the, the scientific explanation comes later. And she uses Thomas Huxley as an example of that, but I think she also could be thinking about Julian Huxley, who was very much prominent at the head at the time and the head of UNESCO, and I believe is the target of a later chapter um, in her discussion of human rights and the ends of man, when she says uh, the totalitarian ideology we face now is no longer um, Bolshevism or Nazism, but evolutionary biology. And I think that brings us right up to the present and the ideology of transhumanism. And I think that the threats and the motivations uh, and the dangers that she describes by the bourgeoisie who are afraid of, you know, not being proved the, the fittest and therefore tempted to engage in eugenics is ever present with us. And I mean, I don't think you have to, if you just watch Fox News, you don't have to integrate Carlson that's this week you would see that you know there's um a 40 percent increase in x uh, in mortality among working age people and there really isn't another explanation for this but things that have been done in the public health emergency not the the, the virus itself and so I think what what is happening what is happening in this chapter is is ever ever present. And there's one other uh, little passage. I, I don't have the page number, but I, I remember she says it's important to understand that when this race thinking is weaponized, it could be weaponized and even no longer be racist. And at the time, she could be thinking very much of Julian Huxley, who was of course a rabid eugenicist at the time and but he said but i'm not like a vulgar genesis uh, eugenicist like hitler i'm a good eugenicist so i want to take the top people of every race and i think that it, it's possible that we are still kind of confronting this type of thinking and there's you know plans for genetic engineering and all kinds of crazy stuff going on and i think that the description of bourgeois in the bourgeois imperialist mentality that verges quickly into totalitarianism is something that we are still experiencing right now today and what she describes is a very apt description and a good warning thank um thank you there's a lot in in what you've said rachel and i'm not sure i i was able to follow all of it part of it is i i have to admit i don't know um you know i don't know the the history you know as well as you do i don't know as much about julian huxley um or, or any of that, and I, I probably should, and, and I appreciate the reference. Um, uh, you know, um, the the discussion of of transhumanism that you that you mentioned is, I think, apt uh, insofar as um, you know, if it is the case that the um, principle and prerequisite for um, for race thinking for racism is um, the 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 sort of idea of um, man as as a as a power as a reckoning power seeking creature uh as opposed to a rational creature um and that there's always going to be um a need therefore to increase power which means you're going to have to um uh you know uh find other people to uh take power from uh, I think if I could just just say add yeah. one thing to, for, as a as a point of clarity, I think it becomes a bit more clear in later chapters in Origins, um, where she pretty clearly says, um, where she very very clearly says that um, totalitarian ideologies are always eugenicist, and they have a notion of changing mankind uh, itself, and that obviously works 
better for the Nazis than the Bolsheviks. But she points out that, you know, Marx loved to be compared to Darwin and he was perfectly happy having the survival of the, the most progressive race. And so there's, and, and then Stalin, of course, was willing to take ideological thinking, you know, that these people are the public health threat or the, the lost race or the, you know, forgot the, you know, they, they actually, I think both the, the Bolsheviks and the Nazis kind of had a, notion of the you know the different industrial revolutions um, okay. um so anyways that's a th there's a there's I'm a not, there. i mean i'm not sure she ever explicitly maybe she does um says what you said about eugenesis but i mean there's no doubt that darwin um and darwin's thinking uh plays an important role in her in her account um uh largely because she says most importantly because of his idea that we're mankind begins in in apes and animals um which creates a kind of progressivism um that allows people to uh distinguish some people as as higher and some people as lower um and 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 so that's an important part of her thinking and and she thinks that while darwinism itself she says is politically neutral right it can lead to pacifism or um or a kind of more violent racism uh it has been mobilized and politicized and used um, it, I, um, I think that's I, I think that's one of the reasons why um the transhumanism presently is such um so the parallel is so striking because if you read klaus schwab's book on the great reset he says that you know the world is coming where there's going to be the augmented people who are as different from human beings as they presently are as like regular human beings were to peking man and he's reproducing that same nazi rhetoric and the same kind of rhetoric that um julian huxley used when he talked about you know our need to remove ourselves from our bodily reality and to transcend into some you know Know, more superior yeah. ethereal kind of reality and I, I, for rent i think it's worth pointing out the julian huxley point because it's the same uh, her opposition to this way of thinking is uh, at the root of her understanding of earth alienation as is going to soon appear in the human condition yeah and no, so, but I, i've taken enough time but thank that's you fine for yeah i mean yeah. if you're if you're interested in any of this I, I i mean i have an s i have a couple essays on this but one is called the singularity in the human condition and um that would be where you would want to pursue some of that if you're interested um but thank you uh um george George, you got to unmute yourself. George? I am. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think this is very interesting. I'm unmuted now, right? Yep. Uh, and, you know, it, then it could lead to a whole conversation about artificial intelligence taking go over for the humans and that kind of business. But getting back to race in America, I just, uh, I, perhaps you can comment on two things. Number one, uh, one of the critiques that I think is a good critique of uh, of uh, of uh, our own thinking was I think it was Ralph Ellison's who said that she was there was too much Grecophilia in her mind that uh, she was she was uh, comparing everything to the Greeks. The second thing is that also I forget who brought this one up, but that she was really mixing up uh, African Americans with German Jews in the sense that she was doing the pariah parvenu thing and saying that the social aspirations of African Americans were sort of like parvenu, is that they, they wanted to be uh, equal in privileges to, uh, to the whites, uh, as opposed to just being politically uh, equal. And uh, you may, you may want to go in that particular direction. So, so let me say, George, those are both good points. They're, they're not totally related to this text, but um, we are going to read uh, her letter uh, to Ralph Ellison later in the in the in in our reading, and 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 I'll certainly talk about Ellison's uh, response, which didn't come directly to her, but was given an interview with um, Robert Penn Warren, um, and. And as and so and and there's a 
there's a wonderful new book on on Ellison and Arendt um, by Marie Louise Knott, who's going to be uh, the Arendt Center fellow next year and speaking at our conference on friendship. Um, um, uh, and it just came out. Unfortunately, it's only in German so far. But uh, once it gets translated, um, I would recommend it. Uh, on on and and then the question of whether to compare, whether she, her her attempts to think. I mean, this is a bigger question, right? Um, the word racism uh, emerges uh, in France uh, as a way of talking about anti-Semitism. Um, uh, we today in the United States typically use racism to talk about white black racism and anti-Semitism to mean um, racism against Jews. Um, one of the important questions for both thinking about anti-Semitism and thinking about racism, racial racism, um, is to what extent those two conversations are um, to be informed by one another um, and to what extent they're different. And it has to be both, I think. You can't imagine it any other way. Um, RN, you know, again, as I said at the beginning of this talk, right, of these, this, this, this discussion, RN has a tendency to speak from this very spectatorial viewpoint. And for her, she talks about racism um, in a way that encompasses both anti-Semitism and um, uh, white black racism uh, and others. Um, to what extent that, of course, misses certain um, important uh, particular differences is, is one we'll have to consider. Um, not so much in this essay, but later when we start talking about what she writes about um, racism in the United States. Um, and, and so that will come back up then. Uh, but for now, um, you know, we didn't really, this this chapter doesn't really get into that. So I'll just note that that's one of the things we have to talk about. And you're right um, when we get into some of her other texts. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, Susan. So she does get into talking about it in this chapter on 177, when she talks about slavery uh, being something that uh, 18th century Americans had no thought that it was going to continue. And I just once again have to wonder at her seeming to let Americans off the hook, let the, the US off the hook on this issue. We know Thomas Jefferson wrote notes on the state of Virginia, which was just full of statements about the inferiority of these people. So I, I really take exception to this characterization. She's, which characterization are we talking? Uh, she says, even slavery, though actually established on a strict racial basis, did not make the slaves, page 177, slave-holding people race conscious before the 19th century. Throughout yeah, the 18th century. But that's true. I mean, Susan, I mean, even almost any, I mean, Ibran Kendi will say the same thing in his book, Stamp from the Beginning. Um, it was, I mean, if you if you look at um, you know, race, you know, what we call race slavery, it was justified on religious grounds and other grounds, um, uh, even at that time. Um, I mean, now uh that's that's what I think she's referring to there. She says even she says British possessions are relapsed into the form of social organs. This is the top of the page. But even slavery, though actually established on a strict racial basis, did not make slaveholding peoples race conscious before the 19th century. I mean, most of what they talked about was religion. They didn't yet have um, a theory of of race in thinking about slavery. At least that's my understanding of the history. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote notes on the state of Virginia in the 18th century, yeah. and it was full of characterizations of the infer natural inferiority of these people. So maybe they didn't all read it, but um, he definitely, and he is a key, you know, figure in this whole thing. Um, and, you know, having lived in Charlottesville for 31 years, they still think he's walking the streets. Yeah. So, um I, I really don't agree with this characterization. Okay. I mean, she then adds, you know, just on two paragraphs below that, 
in America and England, where people had to solve a problem of living together after the ab abolition of slavery, things were considerably less easy, with the exception of South Africa, a country who's, which influenced waste, Western racism only after the scramble for Africa in the 80s. These nations were the first to deal with the race problem in practical politics. The abolition of slavery sharpened inherent conflicts instead of finding a solution for existing serious difficulties. This was especially true in England, where the rights of Englishmen were not replaced by a new political orientation, which might have declared the rights of men. The abolition of slavery in the British possessions in 1834 and the discussion preceding the American Civil War, therefore, found in England a highly confused public opinion, which was fertile soil for various naturalistic doctrines which arose in this in these decades. And the first was the polygenesis, as I said. So it's around this period, right, um, that, uh, as, as, as she's putting it, um, you have to begin, you see the beginning of race doctrines, naturalistic race doctrines, um, which are used to justify um, uh, slavery, which is increasingly seen as... Um, something hard to justify or wrong. And so they come up with justifications. Um, you know, what you pointed to earlier about the 19th century, okay, um, you know, Jefferson's writing in the late 18th, early 19th century. Um, so, uh, you know, we can, it may be that she's off a little bit, right? Um, in, 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 in the time period. And, and maybe she's off more than that. But but that's the argument that she's making is that um, it's around the time that Jefferson writes um, the notes from Virginia, right? That you begin to see what she calls um, a, ra a strict racial basis for and, and justification for slavery. Before that, and slavery, as we all know, started long before that, it wasn't seen that way. Um, at least that's her argument. And as, as, as far as I understand, um, you know, Ibram Kendi's work and, and, and many others, um, my, at least my understanding of it is, is, is they would largely agree with that characterization. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, I'm happy to, you know, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm making, um, I made an effort to, to learn about this, but I, I'm not an expert in this area. So if, if I am wrong, I'm happy to have people, um, tell me. But that's what I take her to be saying. Um, so she says, throughout the 18th century, American slaveholders considered it a temporary institution and wanted to abolish it gradually. Um, you know, that's a factual statement. I don't know if it's true. I mean, it would be interesting for someone to, who, who, who could, who, you know, if that's, I don't know where she's getting that. I take it she's getting it somewhat from Jefferson, um, who even though he did say things about, say, you know, things about the inferiority of, his slaves um, did recognize that um, it was an unjust institution and thought about, you know, and, 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 and spoke about freeing his slaves and spoke about the need to, that he trembles for his country when he thinks that God is just. Well, Kosciuszko left money in his will for Jefferson to free his slaves and Jefferson did not. I don't think he took the money and he certainly didn't free his slaves. So, um, yeah, no, nah, I mean, I'm, that doesn't mean he didn't know it was a problem, right? Well, it means that he had an opportunity to end this supposed temporary institution that people wanted to abolish gradually, which is what happened in the North. They did abolish it gradually, but um, it was firmly entrenched in the South, I think, before. Yeah, Anyhow, I mean, and it's I, and it's around this time, again, this is, again, my understanding of the history. It's around this time that the justifications for slavery switch, right, and become much more um, permanent and racist than they had been before. Um, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, before they were based in things like conquest, um, uh, religion, um, we have to help people, et cetera. And and at some point it becomes it changes and becomes a much more um, brutal and violent justification. 
That doesn't mean the original people weren't violent and brutal. They were. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't. I mean, Ibram Kendi says this very explicitly. It didn't start with a hatred. The hatred came about as a need to justify the brutality. That's his argument in Stamp from Beginning. And I think he's right, as far as I understand it. Um, but again, I'm if if I'm happy to have people, if anyone knows more than I do, you can jump in right now. All right. Um, Joanne. Joanne, you got to un unmute. We're having a lot of problem with this today. When you speak, guys, you got to unmute yourselves. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I had just had one, one or two small points to make, but uh, what Susan has brought up uh, has really stirred a lot of thoughts in my head. Anyway, I wanted to, um, I, I think that the line, and I had marked that line also, um, about uh, slaveholding peoples. Um, I think that's so broad. And at the very least, we would need a few <laughs> footnotes. She gives footnotes to, to other things, but we would need some footnotes there. Um, to defend her, a little on that, I would say that this was 1950 or earlier when she wrote this. We didn't have black studies. We didn't have any kind of African-American history. We didn't have multiculturalism. Um, so there, I mean, it's a, it's a good measure of how far we've come in understanding some of these problems. And I also would say that, um, I would go to somewhere other than Jefferson if I wanted to find out whether um, some of this was race motivated, rate, rate was racist or not. But the, the a point, two points I wanted to make, one is that I, I think it is an important distinction between rate, race thinking and racism. Uh, and I think what race thinking has done even in the contemporary academic setting has, for example, forced people into something called white whiteness studies, which I think is a very good idea because it makes Caucasians, uh, if there is such a thing in any pure sense, it makes them realize that they too have a race and that they, um, need to look at what all the qualities of that race are as well. But they're just the very notion that that uh, whiteness is also a race, I think is important. The main point I wanted to make was that um, I think that, um, and now I forgot the main point because this, this other stuff is done. Um, that that um, wokeness, as it's discussed these days, I wonder, and I wonder what you think about this, Roger. I wonder if what the right thinks of as wokeness is that race thinking has also become thinking about racism, and that which emphasizes the political aspects and the humanitarian aspects of race thinking, which turns into racism, uh, is something that they would like to just keep keep the uh, keep in more of a secret place than they uh, than they have up to now. So I, I don't know. I, I read this whole chapter a little differently than you. I read it as um, a kind of history of ideas of what she saw as some of the major factors that led to racism. Whereas when you, when you described it, you were emphasizing that each one of these types of ideas 
was not racism. But as I read it, I thought, oh, she's taking us on this journey to show us how we wound up with Nazism. Mm. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. That's a, it's a good point. Um, and I think it can be both. Uh, I think she is um, um, looking at race thinking before racism, um, partly to explore, and if you want, the pre-history of racism. Um, uh, and, and there's no doubt, uh, as she says that, um, you know, someone like Gobineau's ideas, um, invent racism by accident. Um, but, uh, there's a couple of reasons I think to, to read it, um, the way I did as, as actually holding out the idea that these are different ideas. Um, uh, you know, one is she says that imperialism would have needed racism and would have invented it if it didn't already exist, race thinking. Um, but I mean, more importantly, she sees these and she calls them opinions and she calls them free opinions. Um, and in doing so, you know, we have to recognize that for our ends, opinions are at the very root of politics. Um, uh, she doesn't see any of these thinkers as um, well racist, but um, you know she may disagree with some of their opinions, but she doesn't think of them as 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 people whose opinions are beyond the pale. Whereas she does think racism is beyond the pale. Um, and so I think if we're going to understand some of her her later work where she wants to defend, she wants to say it is absolutely not okay and not consistent with um, humanity or with our constitution or with our democracy to um, prohibit and require segregation and prohibit integration. She also wants to say it's an opinion that is acceptable to want to send your kids to schools with people of the same race. Right? She's going to hold on to that idea. She's going to want to say that, um, uh, you know, hating Jews, again, not something she likes, is part, is, is not, again, an unacceptable opinion. It's an opinion. And if one wants to have it, uh, it's part of living in a society with different people and plural people. Um. And so, uh, you know, aren't, uh, you know, I, I would say that it's important to take seriously what she's saying, which is that um, these race thinkings are opinions and part of free opinions, some brilliant, some not so brilliant, some crazy, but um, that's part of living in a pluralistic society. Um, and and that we have to understand that yes, when you live in a society and people have create, you know, have have opinions that are hateful and and discriminatory and prejudiced, those can, of course, lead to, um, you know, racism or homophobia or transphobia or Islamophobia or anti-Semitism or all sorts of things, but they don't have to, and. Um, we should be vigilant about um, the move to racism. But our attitudes towards prejudices is going to be different. Or at least this is what I am taking her to be saying, which is not to say that we, you know, we don't argue with people whose prejudices we disagree with. We do. She'll actually end up saying that the the entire work of politics is to, seek to dispel certain prejudices. Uh, that's she's we're going to read that later when we read her essay on on um, introduction into politics. Um, but she's going to say politics cannot seek to get rid of prejudice because prejudice is part of humanity. And um, uh, on the other hand, politics must seek to get rid of racism. 
because racism is anti-humanity. And that distinction um, uh, is one that I think is actually very important to her work. Um, and that's what I've been trying to bring out in my reading of this chapter. Now, you know, I'll admit that I don't really know anyone else who's trying to bring this out in Arendt's work. Um, and, and, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and, um, but I think it's there. And, uh, and I think it actually, I actually think it's actually an important distinction for us to make. But I'm, I, I'm not gonna. I, I I will say that that's a controversial view, and and um, and uh, I'm certainly open to having it argued with. I thank you, and I think it also points up the importance of allowing different voices into the conversation, and the the importance of facts and documents from oppressed peoples because that will change a lot of what we see and that will change what we think of as, uh, well, anyway, that will, that will change things. And that's, that absolutely is true. And we, we need to bring in as many voices as we can and, and we need to um, dispel as many prejudices as we can, um, you know, uh, and to dispel prejudices, however, means will never happen just by telling people that they're prejudiced. You have to do the hard work of um, accepting where their prejudices come from and trying then to um, show them through experience that those, those ossified opinions, which they now take as, um, as certain, uh, don't fit their reality. And that's hard work. And, and that's what Arendt calls the work of politics as the work of dispelling prejudices. Um, uh, but what she also says is, as I said, if I try and dispel your prejudices, I'm doing it from another partisan position. And thus I'm prejudiced too. So the work of dispelling prejudice is never to get rid of prejudices. It's to try and, by talking to each other, um, uh, open up both of our prejudices to a new possibility. And that's the work of politics and to new prejudices. Um, and that's why I think I'm trying to hold on to this distinction between race thinking and racism. That's the, that's the idea here. Um, Julia? Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for this um, discussion. Um, I wanted to start with the idea of an opinion, um, because I've always read that line in this particular chapter um, as Arendt's kind of effort to present things in a more um, multi-causal, complicated way. And for me, in terms of the work that I've done in thinking about race, race cannot be uh, separated from its explanatory power. And so, or race thinking cannot be uh, exempted from its explanatory power. And I'm wondering whether or not there's something about that explanatory power um, that undercuts its just being an opinion. And, you know, like an, on, on not just the sense of forwarding an opinion in a political sense, but there's something about race and the proximity of race with um, scientific thinking and eugenics um, in particular that I think that um, Arendt underreads. And this leads to my second point is, I think that one of the things that I'm interested in, I found the discussion on Hobbes really important and really interesting, but in telling her history on the idea of race, she privileges certain thinkers over other thinkers. And I think that a question that I have is when it comes to a transition between race thinking and then brutal deeds, you also have figures like Kant who are putting forward the idea of a racial seed predicated on life that then gets taken up in terms of racial hygiene. And this leads to narratives of historical teleology and progress. And so I'm interested in at what moment do the status of that kind of an idea 
which builds in an ontology about life and the category of life that then becomes important, right? It's not just the power, it's the scientific status of life leading to racial hygiene. Um, so the eugenics argument, um, there has to be some sort of overlap between um, those history of ideas that I do think come out of German romanticism um, and then the way that they get taken up in this kind of pseudo-scientific nature. And I think there's a lot of people doing work um, in the philosophy of race that are trying to update um, these figures. So a question that I had is if Arendt read different people um, in giving this presentation on the history of race, um, what, what might that open up? Because I am very sympathetic to what she's doing. Um, this distinction between power as the Hobbesian category, but then the status of life um, as a different category, this leads to me to something that I think is really consistently interesting um, because life is important to a rent. Um, it's a structure of the given. There's a problematic status or a, a kind of ontology of the given that is built into obviously what happens with plurality. And she has this really great line on um, page 301. So it's in a later chapter, but I think it's um, worth citing because I think it 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 shows the proximity between Heidegger's thinking of the Jews, but her openness to thinking about race and being in an American context. So it's the alien is a frightening symbol of the fact of difference as such. And so race is about differentiation of individuality as such and indicates those realms in which man cannot change and cannot act and in which therefore he has a distinct tendency to destroy. If a Negro in a white community is considered a Negro and nothing else, he loses along with his right to equality that freedom of action, which is specifically human. All his deeds are now explained as necessary consequences of some Negro qualities. He has become some specimen of an animal species called man. And so that's part of the sense of the explanatory power of race in action, but located in a fact of difference and one that is tied into the given. And for me, that that puts race in a way that is really interesting in terms of what Arendt does with plurality um, in the human condition. And then I would just say, you know, historically, I'm in just, terms of race- I'm asking so much, I'm trying to follow it all, Julia, so I'm just sorry. Okay. Um, um, okay. Go ahead. Which, try, try and just finish up, because I'm, I'm just, yeah. there's too much here yeah. that I can't answer all of it. And even- Okay, the US on. context, um, you know, like it influenced um, both you know, Nazi eugenics, and then also the legal context, right? So US racial policy is right there in where Nazism goes, right? There's, there's, there's a further history of an idea to tell that puts, you know, um, a US history of eugenics, very specifically miscegenation and law um, also into a, what would be a great story um, with a rent. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, this is probably a, a, a multi-day conversation. Um, and I'm not going to be able to, you know, I, I'm just not going to be able to process everything you said. Um, but I certainly uh, agree with the last part um, uh, about, you know, the need for the conversation in the U.S. context and eugenics. Um, you know, you started off with this question of opinion. And part of the problem I'm having is that I got very caught up thinking about that because it's something I'm quite interested in. And then I was trying to follow the other stuff you said as well. But on, on the question of opinion, um, you know, I, I the background here is I, I'm writing a paper on this right now. And the editors um, wrote back a question saying, are prejudice and opinion the same? They don't think so. And I've just been trying to answer that question all morning before I logged on with you guys. So, um, you know, this is in my head. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that um, all opinions are prejudice. All prejudices are opinions, but not all opinions are prejudices. You have um, some opinions uh, that are, uh, um, are thoughtful opinions. Uh, 
and this is what I was, this is actually what led me to this way of introducing this whole discussion today when talking about her, 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 her thinking about judgment and the spect the spectator uh, versus the actor. Um, you know, when we read the, the Kant's political lectures a couple months or a couple, about a year ago now, um, I mean, in this group, uh, you know, I really focused on this conflict in her work between the spectator and the actor. Um, and, you know, an opinion for her um, can either be a spectatorial opinion, at which point it becomes a judgment, a thoughtful judgment, or it becomes a partisan opinion, at which point it becomes a prejudice. Um, you know, your if I took your question to be, if I understood it correctly, Julia, it's that um, isn't ra aren't racial opinions not only prejudices, but in a sense by their force in some way um, more than that and almost um, uh, almost violent. I take that to be, maybe I, just tell me if I got that right. I, I think that was the force of your question. Um, um, I kind of see Arendt doing something that is more Foucauldian with the idea of opinion. Like there's a kind of contestation of you know, possible interpretations that are going on. Um, and then the problem with race is what race thinking does cannot be separated from its explanatory power. And so there is no idea of race beyond its explanatory, explanatory power. And that explanatory power seems to authorize something that is not at the level of a political opinion, which is why race thinking has the power to destroy body politics um yeah i mean you know uh does race does does every time we use the word or the idea of race um you know mean that we are you know it has an explanatory power that that cuts out all explanations you know um uh i i i think i think <sighs> You know, I mean, there was some, there was a lot of argument about this just last month uh, around, you know, the, the Tyre incident, right? In which, you know, there was one group that wants to see this as racist policing and another group saying, well, the police officers were black. And what does that matter? Because blacks can be racist too. But there was a question of whether um, to talk about race you know, offers one solution and one question and whether it has a full explanatory power. And I think what some people are trying to say is, no, it's a lot more complicated than that. You can have race be a factor. You can have race meaning something in society and not have it be a full explanatory power. Um, uh, is that the case? Uh, um, I think Arendt believes that in so far as we're talking about race thinking, and racial opinions, it is, you know, that it does, it's not fully explanatory. She thinks that if it's racist, it is fully explanatory. Um, and, and I think you could say that that's actually maybe a good, maybe a good um, uh, standard for determining whether something is simply a, a racial opinion or a racist ideology um, in that it, in sense to, it seeks to provide a full um, uh, causal explanation uh, in a pseudoscientific way. Um, you know, I, 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 Arendt is, as, you know, as someone who suffered anti-Semitism, which is a form of racism, certainly understood um, the damage that racism does to individuals. She was deeply aware of it. Uh, and she writes a lot about it. But what she says is, that's part of life. That's part of living in a pluralistic society. Um, but anti-Semitism, where you want to, you know, de dehumanize and kill all Jews is not part of living in a pluralistic society. Um, and, and and so I think I think she's quite serious in calling it uh, a free opinion and calling it things that, you know, that she that, that and 
and and and now you know maybe you know we're at a point where you can't have free opinions about race anymore and if that's the case that's an argument one would have to make um you know i think it's a pro you know that that raises real problems because race is a big part of our society and if we can't talk about race except in a racist way that predetermines things we're gonna we're in a lot of trouble um so uh you know i hear what you're saying i think i do if i understand if i hope i'm understanding it correctly and, and speaking to what you're saying um but i i would push back and say i i don't think that's where she is um and she may be wrong right which is fine but I've tried to articulate why I think she actually has a point. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, on the other questions, I may have to, um, you know, maybe we'll come back to them over the next few weeks if that's all right. Cause I just was focused on that one and trying to answer, cause I thought it was a great question and I wanted to try and answer it. Okay. Um, I know we're out of time. Um, Vignes and Shadi, do you want to say something quickly, and then we'll move on, and we'll and we'll reconvene next time. I can say quickly. It's just about the, this thinking um, separation racism from race thinking. I just thought that uh, what all and and um, the last sentence before uh, the chapter on the race of aristocrats against the nation of citizens. And where she says, and I think this is the danger, and it comes also from the Jewish writings about race, when race is seen, it's a kind of dividing up what we else call mankind. So the danger appears when the principle of equality and solidarity of all peoples guaranteed by the idea of mankind is dissolved. Then you're into racism yeah. on that level. But we have other, as we we kind of we have individuals and we have family and then we have social groups and we all social beings. On those levels, there are opinions and there are prejudices. Okay. But when we have this on the level of mankind, that is where racism come in. I just wonder if you if that. Yeah, I think so. And I'm gonna not answer it because we're out of time. I'm gonna try. Oshadi, are you here still? Is Shadi still yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm just going to let you say something and then we're going to go because we're out of time. So I apologize. But we'll continue this conversation, obviously, for the next few weeks and you can always come back. But just just if you have a question or a point, I let you make it. Yeah, um, two things uh, I wanted to say in my mind, prejudice is emotionally pumped opinion. That's how I see it sometimes. Emotionally what? Emotionally pumped opinion. So it's it's an opinion that it's uh, that it's a bit pumped by some emotions and feelings and personalized uh, uh, kind of experience, but um, I, I I wanted to say on 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 Arendt's um, Arendt's um, thought on racism um, maybe next time when you have uh, have time to explain um, I wanted to know how much you think that Arendt's opinion um, on on race is actually the product of the despair after Holocaust. The way a brilliant mind wanted to explain all the awfulness of, of what happened and the, the dynamics of power that it's out of control sometimes. So I see that you, if you are rational and you try to live with a, with a tragedy like that, you try to accept it in a way of explaining it and understanding it. That's that. I wanted to know what you think about that. Maybe next time. Yeah, I, I you know I think we'll come back to it. I mean, I think she actually thinks racism is meaningfully important in in un understanding totalitarianism, um, and I think she wants to talk about it. Uh, but she feels the need to. Um, be precise in talking about racism and thus to make this distinction. Um, uh, I think part of it is comes from the first part of the book on anti-Semitism, where she wants to argue that anti-Semitism as an ideology, again, only emerges in the 19th century. Um, and that before it, it was just Jew hatred. And while Jew hatred is not good, it's not dangerous in her mind. Um, not dangerous in the sense it is in in totalitarianism. And so I think this is part of that same 
argument. It's an attempt to understand what's distinctive about totalitarianism, which is what, in many ways, what this book is about, what is distinctive about totalitarianism. And one aspect of it is that it's um, uh, very much one of its main, uh, um, uh, I, I, one of the, the main sort of things underlying it is racism. Um, and, and so she wants to understand the difference because there's been, there's been prejudice and hatred of peoples for millennia, right? What changed? That's what she's interested in. And, uh, and that's what she's trying to get at in these two chapters. Okay. Um, listen, I want to thank you all. These are very difficult things to talk about. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm excited to do so and yet approach it with a kind of, you know, not knowing where it's going to go. And I appreciate the critiques. I appreciate the pushbacks. Um, and I appreciate the civility which which we had it. So um, thank you all and enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. We're going to discuss chapter seven um, on, uh, on race and bureaucracy uh, for next week. And I'll see you then. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. Thanks very much.